Hello, everybody. How are we? Come on. <laughs> this is the digital future of our country, and it feels like we're half asleep. So um, I'm going to run through a presentation I gave at um, Space Fest, which is like a... Um, it's like a... It's like this, but for space geeks um, rather than network geeks. Um, and actually, one of the things um, I thought when I volunteered to do this, I thought, oh, yeah, this would be awesome. Um, and, and what's really, when I present, um, it's great. It's really easy because you kind of know the subject. This I can add have, have to go and kind of really do some research and find out, Craig, it's actually hard to talk about something that you don't know. Um, a huge amount about, or you're not kind of um, inversed in it. So, um, so um, why is the space program important to me? So, I'm named after Neil Armstrong. Um, have any of you seen the movie Train Spotting? Hands up. Okay, that's where I grew up. And and whilst there are some um, theatrical enhancements of the um, of the world there, it wasn't a million miles away from reality. Um, and kind of being named after Neil Armstrong kind of gave me this um, vision of something better than coming home at night and finding you've been burgled for the fifth time that week because the, the crack and heroin addicts needed a fix. Um, so it kind of maybe explains um, why I'm so passionate about this, because really this is this whole, um, the, the space program kind of got me into engineering um, and took me forward. Let's just pay the bills very quickly. I work for BT. We've got a network. You can buy it. It's the best in the world. Um, that's the bills paid. Where are we? Um, sorry, it's big. Um, I, 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 oh, sorry. Um, here we go. Um, and, and the other thing, um, the, the, the thing I, I kind of like to, to kind of talk about is um, actually the network for me, getting involved in the network, actually I got involved in computing engineering kind of on a trajectory to, to kind of get into space and aeronautics. Um, and actually I kind of, the computing program element of it um, was much more, it actually kind of caught me much more excitedly, I think, my granddad put 10 pence in a Space Invaders machine and I was kind of hooked on it. But what, what I've found very, what, what I've kind of realized over time um, is that getting people connected, the, the job that we do is probably one of the most honorable jobs that we've, in the world. Um, because we give people opportunity. Um, and if I think about my own histor history, um, getting into networking the internet and working with all you guys, arguing with you, kind of drinking with you and, and, and then saying that we're not going to pair with you has kind of been a real, um, a real, um, you know, a real, a real life changer for me and, f and probably for many of us in here. And I love this picture um, because it really shows the difference that we've made in the world. And, and I often take pictures of audiences because, and I, I wouldn't I'd do it now, but I've got a mic in my hand, because I believe in 10 years you'll all be sitting there with wearables on. Um, and, and the thing, you know, the, the impact that we have and that we continue to have in the world is super important. So that's kinda, that kind of gives you a bit of, of background. There's a guy, um, perhaps a controversial guy, a guy called Werner von Braun, um, a rocket scientist. Um, he has a famous quote um, that I always use with my boss um, that, that kind of, you know, actually whenever you're doing something, you're learning. Um, anyway, the, this, so it's the 50th anniversary of Apollo, Apollo 11 this year. Um, and this, pro, this, this presentation's about the communi communications in the space um, world. And, and it starts really around 1955, National Research Laboratory in the US, they were trying to figure out how could they get a satellite into space. And more importantly, actually they thought getting into space was easy. They were wrong on that. Um, but what they thought was hard was actually, how do we get some info, information from it? And they were looking at you know, optical, you know, big telescopes, radar, didn't really have the range, and, and a, a technology actually that we've started to reuse in 5G, which is kind of, amu kind of amusing. Interferometry, that's basically where you send two signals and allow them to interfere with each other. 
And if there's an object that it sees, um, the results that you get back um, allow you to kind of track it. Um, and, and they built for, for um, let me just go back actually, for Vanguard, which was, which was a, a satellite project uh, that the US, US military were involved in. Um, there was lots of them actually. Um, it was important that they were able to track satellites. Little did they know though, and this is, this is an example of something that, 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 that they built um, to track what was Vanguard actually, uh, and that's the control site for it. Um, and, and this is a real picture, and actually the thing that's really um, uh, eye-opening for me was how many women were involved in the space program at a very early age. You, hopefully you've all seen hidden figures. That kind of, it's kind of, that actually is like a tiny part of it, um, and it's great to see, and, and I don't know how, how that got lost in the ethos of time. Um, but something called Sputnik happened, um, which kind of freaked a few people out. Um, and, and, and quickly, um, really because of that, uh, NASA was formed. What was, what was really, um, in, at the time there was a lot of the US agencies fighting with each other about who should be leading on space. Um, and, and the system that they built originally to track something that they never managed to launch, they were able to change it to 40 megahertz and they were able to track uh, Sputnik very quickly. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, U.S. government and military think, hmm, maybe we should put a lot more money into this. And they did, a hell of a lot more money. Um, and then, so th they tried to launch many rockets. This is Kaputnik, as the press called it, because um, they, la they tried three times to launch a satellite and couldn't. Meanwhile, the U.S. Army with um, Explorer and Juno um, were successful in getting a satellite uh, into space, first U.S. satellite. Uh, it looks almost identical uh, to Sputnik, but was was quite different. Um, and there was this um, big, 19, late 1950s, there was this um, international geophysical year. It was like, um, it was basically all the countries of the world coming together to do interest in scientific projects. The only country that wasn't represented um, was China, and a lot of it was around space and aero, um, aero um, technology and radar and radio technology. And that, that project's really what kicked off um, Juno and Explorer and kind of got the funding for it because America wanted to say, hey, we're big in this space, um, even though they, they, they probably weren't. Um, and then from that point forward, from um, 58 to 62, they ran this mini track and they were tracking all sorts of um, space vehicles, some that they launched, some that were launched by others. Um, and actually, probably the U.S. had an advantage in this space that they didn't realize. They, had, they, they were able to track a lot more than um, probably the, the Soviet um, Russia knew at the time. Um, it then transformed into StatDan, which is Satellite Tracking and Data Acquisition Network. Um, this was a much more kind of, we're going to run this as a proper organization, and put some specialism into it. And then after that, as, as um, kind of Gemini, and uh, that, that ran through Mercury, as Gemini and Mercury wound down, um, this kind of migrated into the manned space flight network. Um, and, and this just kind of shows some of the early technologies that were used in StatDan. Again, phase-based um, and, and interferometry-based tracking systems. Um, actually, the phase stuff, again, is, is a technology we've kind of reintroduced to some extent into 5G to, to manage alignment of satellites. Um, and, and actually, this is one of the great things. Um, if you, you know, we take for granted that we take pictures of everything. You know, in the 60s, you try and get pictures of some things going on in the 60s, it's really hard, but in the space program, there's lots of content. It's phenomenal um, that it's there. Um, I can't remember what this graph was supposed to say, so I'm going to skip it. Um, this, this, um, this is um, the satellite network. Um, that, that many uh, countries collaborated on, um, you know, more so in the kind of NATO countries as we know it, um, to kind of track, um, you know, there's big fear that um, you'd wake up one day and you'd be nuked and no one would know about it. There's a huge amount of work on radar technology, early launch technology, platform called Sage, um, which is a kind of a compute platform. If you go to the... the Silicon Valley Computer Center, you'll actually see a real Sage platform. You, you used to see it in the background of programs like the Six Million Dollar Man, all these lights flashing. They were real Sage um, terminals. Um, so 
we step into the real manned uh, space flight era, um, Mercury, Gemini and Apollo in, in the um, early 60s. I, I won't talk much about the Soviet Union. It's not that I wouldn't like to. It's actually really hard to get any data on it, on what they were using to track, who was doing what and, and how it worked, um, which is a great shame because when you look at the firsts, um, and, and actually there's a slide that I've, I've got in our presentation I should bring in, pretty much all the firsts apart from kind of five or six, you know, so the first vehicle on Mars um, was Russia, uh, Soviet Union, um, first man in space, first woman in space, um, you know, they, they really did a great job and, and not a lot of the history is well understood, which, is a, which I think is a bit of a shame. Um, so, you know, first of all, we're launching, you know, there's a real push to, to, to get um, people into to space and, um, you know, the US is behind, so they're kind of building this network, most of which was um, telephone line based, um, occasionally high speed network, I'll tell you what high speed network is, but you can get the kind of, the, the, you know, they're trying to build, some of these were, were ships, um, you know, radar ships or, or, or other types of ships that were tracking the tra trajectory as the, um, as the vehicle launched. And the, the big challenge of Mercury was is it never got far enough away from the planet where you could, you know, go to three or four locations. It was always low Earth orbit, so you need a lot of locations to track it. Um, and this, this gives you a, a, an idea of the, of the network um, that they had. High speed data link, four bits a second. It's a bit like a Vodafone broadband line. Um, <laughs> and um, it wouldn't be exciting if I didn't have, make a few gags, right? I love Vodafone, they're a great customer. Um, or, or we're a great customer. Um, so, um, but you can kind of see that the, you know, actually the first real networks are starting to come together for this, this purpose. And, and I, I, you know, when you look at it outside of t um, telegraph and telephony, these are really the first data networks um, that, that, were, that were built. Um, a lot of them using uh, microwave and, and kind of radio telescope um, stuff. Um, and then MSN, Manned Space Flight Network, so um, basically um, as spacecraft started to get further away um, and, and also the, the kind of the range that they had from launch to, to um, orbit, um, it, what the US really realized was they really needed to build a proper network um, with the right radio telescopes, the right radio receivers, um, across the world, and clearly, in, at this time, you know, you got the Cold War going on, so finding sites and working with folks was really, really challenging. There's some movies on some of this stuff that, um, you know, if you're interested in this, I'd encourage you to have a look at. Um, this is a manned space flight network at Hawaii. It's not a great picture, um, but this is actually still there. Uh, a lot of this is still there. You can go and visit, if, and, and actually, this is again another great stuff. There's quite a lot of this still in use today. Um, this is Enos, um, the, the monkey that went up, um, was, was probably one of the first, probably the first most tracked animal ever. Um, and, and sadly, um, uh, kind of, the kind of stupidity of it is, is if they'd stuck a person in, they would have, America would have beat Russia. And it's that kind of risk and reward. Um, so, um, U.S. is building all the infrastructure for Apollo. It needs to come up with all the kind of formulas to, for things like rendezvous, um, you know, plot and being sure that when a, a, a vehicle comes back into the atmosphere, they know where it's going to land. Um, and, and one of the big barriers to success was communications. And, and I've not yet found out who this was, but someone was really smart and said, okay, we need to move to kind of an integrated system where all the telecommunications um, is kind of in a single system. And it was probably one of the only systems where they decided to do that, given this was a prop, remember the space program was a propaganda um, thing really. Um, and you know, having pictures and knowledge and comms and this, you know, spaceman saying, hey America, we're great, was really important. 
So again, a lot of time was spent on this. The first big deployment was the construction of mission control at Houston. Um, so prior to that, they were in a kind of shed, which unfortunately was knocked down. I can't believe they did this, but four years ago, they leveled the original Gemini control center, which I think whoever did that should be found and buried somewhere. Um, because, and they didn't really capture the history of it. Um, Mocker 2, they've just reopened um, in Houston. You can go and see how it, how, it was at, um, how it was at the point where Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I'd really recommend you do that. It's phenomenal. Uh, you used to be able to go in there. You can't anymore. But um, the, the first big move was, okay, we're going to build a real proper control center. Uh, they created a network team, uh, which is now based in Goddard, NASA Goddard on, on the East Coast. Um, and then, and then, you know, okay, what are our requirements? And I kind of think of this almost as a CDN. Um, you, you know, you've got voice, telemetry, control, and, and what was really important at the time, video. And it's kind of like a reverse CDN. You're trying to bring, you've got one um, thing that you're trying to um, get information about, and you're trying to then deliver it to the whole world. Um, I researched, I, I spent a lot of time in BT archives trying to find out what part BT played in this. Sadly, not a lot. Um, the only thing we, we, we played a part on was we carried all the pictures, all the, all the video of, of when Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz landed on the moon. All the pictures came in via BT, or as, as it was then the, the GPO, um, and we distributed them across to the, the TV channels, which is predominantly the, the BBC at that time. Um, so here's a kind of flow diagram for what we needed to create. Um, a whole load of stuff um, around, you know, clearly there's big lots of people saying, well, we need to know what's going on in the, in the vehicle. Uh, we need to be able to talk to the astronauts. Um, and there'll be things that get in the way and different, different requirements to talk as you're launching, going into orbit, to going um, um, out of orbit into deep space. There's a whole bunch of different things that you need. And they kind of put this together um, as the kind of system view of it. And then the key thing, um, and I kind of love this, they used a two gigahertz band. So it was like Wi-Fi in space, um, which, I think's, which I think is fantastic. And a lot of, a lot of things that we've, we kind of look at today are similar to this. So you've got receive, where you're receiving video, um, voice, telemetry, range, um, some multiple bands because you had, um, in, in Apollo you had obviously the CSM, the main vehicle, but you also had the lunar lander. Um, and they were on different frequencies. Um, and then you had to transmit back to the craft as a kind of a backup for where is the craft. Um, so the, the Apollo guidance computer um, was very good at knowing where it was, but occasionally if, if you had certain, certain scenarios, it, would, you know, it could figure it out, but it took time. But the more information you could feed it, the quicker it would be on telling you where exactly you are. Super important uh, for Apollo 13. Um, so using an S-band with subcarriers, you're carrying voice, video, and telemetry. Um, actually not wildly different to, to what we do today. Um, pretty and, and pretty much um, the space industry kind of still uses this type of technology, but in, in slightly different bands. Um, I, I guess kind of covering what I've said. So you've you got voice, TV, biomedical. Actually, the astronauts themselves, are they, are they alive? Um, and um, data that they were pushing up. Uh, usually um, updates to the system, again, very important. Uh, actually, important in Apollo 15 and Apollo, thir and, and Apollo 13. Apollo 15 couldn't dock with the um, lunar lander when they were trying to grab it, and they had to make, they, they pushed a change so that they could go a bit faster and, and kind of crash into it and grab it. Um, and then range, very important, where are you? Um, and also things like beacon for when you, for when you kind of when you're recovery, where, you know, the ship's going to find you, where are you? And this was all in one system. Um, I'll skip over that. I mean, I just get, so the other thing that Apollo left behind, so th there's some stuff that's, that was there. Um, all SEPs, like a, a science project that, that was transmitting from the moon for years. Um, the lunar module, particularly Apollo 17, transmitted pictures back of Apollo 17 leaving. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of the frequencies we're using. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, so I, I met, I met um, a guy who was involved in this, uh, actually at a previous Space Fest. One of the biggest challenges that they had was actually picturing um, what it would look like. Because, you know, 
no one knows what it's like to be on the moon. And no one knows that if you're on the moon, you need to bounce a signal off the vehicle in space um, at certain times of the day to get it back to the UK. So there was a lot of education to get people to kind of think, actually, how would this work? What would the procedures be? That's one of the diagrams for it. This is some of the real radio um, equipment that was used. Um, this, this was pretty much in every uh, Apollo vehicle. Um, you see the, this is the S-band boost um, uh, receiver and transmitter here. This, if you ever watch uh, a video, you'll see this move as it, as it, again, uses range to figure out the best way of connecting. Um, really impressive technology for its time. Um, and, and there's one in, you can actually see that work in, in uh, Houston. Um, What's this about? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, this is, this is again an expansion of all the different radio transmitters. So as well as using S-band, there was VHF as a backup. Again, in Apollo 11, that VHF backup was quite important at one point of the, the mission. Um, and then there's a tracking network. So how do we track everything? Um, so here are the kind of sites. Uh, here's a kind of flow, flow diagram of uh, the manned space flight network. They called it NASCOM. Um, you know, kind of, you can kind of see the walls in the shape of it. Uh, this was for AS-204, which is Apollo 5, um, which was a Saturn 1 test, unmanned test. Um, and then it developed, this is, this is Apollo 11. And, and basically what you start to see is, is, is uh, what, what's incredible is uh, kind of learning from the gaps in telemetry that they had. And you'll see some changes. Um, they, you know, plug in those gaps very, very, very quickly. And the big challenge, of course, you're launching from Kennedy Space Center, you've got o nothing but ocean, so you're having to deploy um, ships uh, to be able to track the launch and, and be really sure about um, the kind of exit atmosphere parameters so that you know where you are, so that when you go into um, translunar injection to go to the moon, that all the parameters are right. Really important phase of, phase of the launch. And, and just a, an expansion is where they're using satellite as backup, some hard, again, some hard telephony lines um, and, then, and then actually, once you're away from Earth, it gets a lot easier because you really only need three places. And this was um, Goldstone in the US, Spain, just outside Madrid. If you're ever in Spain, go um, south of Madrid. Um, and then Australia, which is, uh, you'll all have seen, hopefully seen the movie about that place. Um, where it, really easy to track them from that point in time uh, and really easy for the signals to come back. Um, and, and here they are, Goldstone and, and Parks. Uh, USN SM Vanguard. So when I gave this presentation, I was kind of I was kind of blown away by it. Um, the guy who took this picture was in the room. And um, he kind of stood up and came onto stage and talked about it. Uh, it was phenomenal. Um, and some of the challenges they had on, on the ship stuff and just being in the right place and staying where they are. Um, it was quite, it was kind of, it was kind of wacky to be presenting about something that some guy had done in the room. Um, uh, that's Madrid. Um, and then, uh, where are we today? Um, actually, it's all still there. You can go to the Deep Space Network. I've, I did this, did a bit of this in the UK and off. Um, it's, um, you can track many things live on this. Um, so when they destroyed the satellite into, um, Jupiter, you could actually see it, see the signal disappear on this site. It's a phenomenal site that NASA does, and this is the kind of latest deep space network node. This one's at Guam, um, phenomenal kind of engineering and build. Um, and here's some nice pictures that I particularly like of of Apollo. So, the top picture, um, I have a signed version of that from a guy called Gene Cernan. Um, he was the last man to walk on the moon. And I, I, he was a, I've met him, met him a few times, and, and the, um, he, um, he said to me, um, I was talking about some of the challenges we have in our industry. He was really interested, because he had an iPhone, he was really interested in how it worked. And what he said was, um, he said, he, he wrote this on the, the picture, it's in my house, if, if you're ever in the neighborhood. Um, he said, um, Neil, you'll never know how good you are unless you try. And then he said, you've got to dream big and go out and make it happen. And then the last thing he said, I walked on the moon. What can't you do? That's it.
I've stolen Jeremy's mic, <laughs> which will be on eBay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Is there any questions for Neil while he's still here? Okay.